So welcome to the uh, Upstate Women in Film and Television first webinar, Impact and Changes in Hudson Valley Film and Television Production Post-COVID-19. We're going to start as we wait for our participants to uh, come on to the program with us um, and just do a little, little icebreaker with our panelists. So we're going to start, or, is there anyone who wants to start? I know Summer probably does. So <laughs> we're going to do a little icebreaker, nothing professional. We're just going to kind of get to know people personally. What is one thing uh, that you guys have done during pandemic time uh, that you never thought you'd ever do um, before this? Well, I have spent so much time in the garden. My backyard has never looked better. And I read this article years ago about, I have a prop I'm going to show you, about what you do if you have romaine lettuce. You <laughs> cut it and you put it in a little bowl of water and you guys, it grows a new head of lettuce. This is four <laughs> days old. Look at its little roots. I mean, I have, I'm naming him Fred. His name is Fred. He smells good. Okay. That's, my, that's my story. Tony thinks I have too many. There's like a whole shelf of them going. <laughs> I don't think there's too many. Um, All right, Tony, what about you? Um, I never thought a, a time would come when I would actually know all the contents of every drawer in my home, <laughs> and I do now. <laughs> so I actually know what's in there. So that's been uh, exciting in a very uh, sort of somber, subdued sort of a way. <laughs> now if asks for but, something, you know. It's not as exciting as the, the head of lettuce, but, but still, <laughs> it's something. <laughs> okay, Rita. So I've kind of become a gourmet cook and the housekeeper and um, a housewife, which my husband didn't marry a housewife. And yeah, and I'm nailless. I have no nails and no eyebrows done. I never thought this would happen. <laughs> <laughs> if you know Rita, and I know, I know I've seen Rita before, she's always made up, she's, she's always ready to go. <laughs> All right. Um, anybody else want to jump in? What have you done that you've never done before pandemic? Marie? I have gotten my boys to clean toilets, to do dishes, to do laundry, to fold laundry, to make food, to clean up food, clean the entire house from top to bottom, which I never thought would be possible in my lifetime. Yeah, I am, I'm in the same boat, too. I, my son's been doing more chores now than he's ever done. And I feel like I did that because I did so. <laughs> They're doing it through me. Uh, what do you think, Nora? Well, I found out that my life has not changed because I am an extreme introvert. And uh, yeah, it hasn't changed that much. <laughs> so, so it's pretty much I'm the same pretty stuff. Much, pretty much the same thing. Uh, I think like maybe like you know maybe uh, I never thought I'd actually want to go out more but yeah this isolation has been a little bit crazy and uh yeah I kind of miss getting up and going to the office now I can just like roll out of bed and you know set up my couch office and I'm at work so uh but uh I'm grateful but uh yeah and for you those of you panelists that are coming in we're just taking a few minutes before we start uh, waiting for other pan or other um, participants to come in. Um, we're just asking a question of what have you done that you never thought you would have ever done uh, before the pandemic. If you guys want to leave us a, a little chat, a little comment about what you've done that you uh, would have never thought you would have done in the chat, that's fine. Um, I'd love to read some of those from the participants. Hi, Carl. I see your I see your comment. Uh, so, uh, Ruth, what do you what have you done that you've never done before? I uh, was never much of a baker and I, ha I have been baking for the uh, I, I live in Hudson and uh, a lot of neighbors so I, I've taken up bread baking so I've been come like the de facto bread baker for the neighborhood which is it's been fun and luckily I stocked up on yeast before things went south too far mm -hmm. south. What's your favorite kind of bread to make? I make this Sullivan Street bakery bread which is amazing it's called the no need bread and it is ridiculously simple it just, it's flour and hot water and yeast, and you let it rise for 12 to 18 hours, and then you bake it, and it's flawless and uh, super easy, and everybody seems to like it. So, and rye bread, I do a lot of rye bread too. <laughs> we saw, I see a comment from Andrea 
She said she's also an inter an introvert, but it, it's made her want to go out a little bit more than she usually did. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and then Andrea also, she says she's growing uh, vegetables from seeds, kind of like summer, <laughs> both gardeners. <laughs> All right, so um, welcome everyone. Good evening again, and welcome to Upstate Women in Film and Television's first webinar, Impact and Changes in Hudson Valley Film and Television Production, post-COVID-19. Uh, before we begin, I want to extend my thanks to Uplift Board members, Diana Devlin, for figuring out all of this tech stuff that we needed for the webinar. Um, I also wanna thank uh, Yvonne Potter and Jillian Fisher for publicizing uh, and um, spreading the word about the event. And then we also have uh, board member Jen, Jen LaFalse who's going to be um, conducting our Q&A for the participants after the moderated session is done. So it looks like we had about a 100 participants that signed up. And when I looked through uh, who had signed up, it's really a range of, of people all over New York. So we've got people on um, that are from the, ranging from New York City all the way up to Albany. So I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. For those of you who I haven't met yet, I'm Sunny Edelman. Uh, I am um, currently holding the title of President of UPWIF, which is Upstate Women in Film and Television. I'm going to be the moderator for tonight. Uh, after the moderated session, we're going to have uh, a participants Q&A. So feel free as we're going through uh, the questions. If you have a question, you can um, type it into the Q&A box. This is a little different because it's a webinar. So if you go down to the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A box and you just click on that and then you can type in a question. Um, but it, when you do that, please uh, put down if you want to address a particular panelist. Um, their name along with your question. And then if you want to also add your name to it as well so we can see who's, who's asking questions. Um, and I do have some questions. I saw, I had some people that um, emailed me questions which I will ask uh, after the moderated part. So a um, few words about Uplift if you don't know who we are. We're a women's organization with members ranging from the base of Hudson Valley all the way to the capital region. We provide collaboration and support for professional women working in film, television, and digital media industries. If you're interested in joining Uplift, um, you can always check out our membership page at our website at uplift.org. So the COVID-19 cor coronavirus pandemic has had sweeping effects in the public health business and travel sectors, among others. And while the repercussions for the entertainment industry may pale in comparison to the threat the virus poses to human life, the ripple effects do have um, implications for people who make a living producing and distributing movies. We feel that ripple here in the Hudson Valley as film production came to a grinding halt. It's my pleasure to introduce our accomplished panelists who are helping to make changes and bring it all back. Rita Powers of Rita Powers Casting Group is a former agent with A Plus Agency and has been casting since 2003. She arrived in the Hudson Valley with a bang, holding one of the largest open calls for the HBO series, I Know This Much Is True. It's streaming now. Oh, Rita just, oh, you have your name there, so I was gonna say wave. <laughs> Summer Crossmore <laughs> and Tony Glazer of Umbra Studios in Newburgh, New York. They're both award-winning actors, producers, and managing partners of Choice Films Incorporated and Choice Theatricals. They have hosted dozens of local pro uh, productions that filmed at Umbra, as well as working on their own projects. Tony and Summer are executive producers for the much-anticipated Big Dogs, soon to be released worldwide. Ruth Moe is the executive producer of Lumberyard Studio in Catskill, New York. She has produced over 70 performances while part of Lumberyard. Prior to that, she was the producer for Sarah Lawrence College Theater Department. Her experience in film includes work for HBO, Lakeshore Entertainment, Fats Films, Big Dog Films, and Blue Bug Productions. Nora Martinez of Orange County Film and Tourism is a media professional and camera operator with over 10 years of experience in broadcast, digital media, narrative film, talk shows, reality TV, and nonprofit marketing. Nora joined the Orange County uh, 
Arts Council in 2016 and continues to coordinate with film and television productions, support local hire initiatives, and develop campaigns to market and draw productions to Orange County, New York as a film specialist for Orange County Film and Tourism. Marie Nassen, not sorry, Nash, Nashin. I'm unmuting. Naxon. Sorry, Marie. Marie. That's my maiden name eventually, but it's Naxon for now. Naxon. Executive Director of Stock Aid Works. I should know this, really. Uh, in Kingston, New York. Marie is an accomplished professional with over 20 years of combined work in PR, marketing, fundraising, economic development, and community relations. She's also serving right now as Uplift's Vice President of Development. Thank you, Marie. So we're going to start our questions off with Rita. Oh, and I have to say, um, when I say a big bang, Rita came in. Um, probably the biggest open casting call I've ever seen. Rita, I remember counting. I was counting the applications at the, at the auditions. And I think we had like 4,000 people show up at that audition for HBO. It was crazy. So um, my first question um, with... <laughs> My first no, question I, I, for calls in every city, and I've never seen anything like it. Never. Uh, it, uh, yeah, I mean the line wrapped her whole way around the Civic Center. It was it was crazy. Um, so my question is, uh, what changes do you see coming with the casting process, and how is it going to affect your business? Okay, so the trend has been happening anyway that casting is virtual. We're gonna have to virtually cast. And you know, every part of pre-production they're saying now, because I'm reading all, you know, sag -AFTRA's, um guidelines and everything, you know, the DGA, and it's pretty much casting is gonna go virtual. Which the trend has been for the last couple of years. I have had way more um, virtual castings than I've had, or even self-submitted. Now it's even gonna go, to the, you know, for the lead roles. I'm doing self-submission on smaller jobs, but now it's actually going to be because all the technology's gotten better because of this too. And everybody, even Facebook, you can go into rooms and do something now. So we can do virtual casting pretty much on a, a lot of different, with a lot of different technology. Hmm. Um, have you been doing, have you been changing your, um, your business to reflect that? So you've been adding a lot more technology? I have been doing this for a while. Um, I actually been teaching on Zoom for a while. I've been working on Zoom for a while. I've been, I, I, had a, I got a little more skilled with my Dropbox. That's all I'm going to say because now that I'm home, my assistants do all the technology and it's all me. So I had to get a little more skilled in Dropbox. But other than that, I got it. Yeah, I have a love-hate relationship with Dropbox. I cancel it like every month. I'm like, I hate this. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so do I. Next question. This is for Umbra and Lumberyard. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address Umbra first and then Ruth, you can take over. The question is, what changes will need to be made um, with how productions use studio space? Um, and are you in the process of making those changes now? Summer and Tony? Yeah, I'm going to yeah. let Tony answer and then I'm going to email this to the chat because it's a whole list of what we've changed. Oh, nice. <laughs> So we, we've changed a lot of stuff, as Summer was saying. You know, our list is our first uh, our first blush. We have a COVID council. We have a lot of people that we're consulting with. This particular list is going to be coordinated with all the unions, the state, and so it's going to change. And so we'll certainly send this out to people uh, as a starting place. But everybody should know that uh, we're taking everybody's suggestions. There should really be a global uh, list somewhere, certainly in our region, about the best way to approach things, not just from facilities, but from productions. I think we should all be sort of speaking the same language and sort of agreeing on the same thing. So all that said, you know, we're changing, um, we're changing doorknobs so that people aren't turning doorknobs. We're changing, um, we're having a lot of, uh, you know, no touch sanitation uh, areas or stations put up around the area so people can sanitize. We're going to be giving out masks and Purell and gloves to people. Everybody's going to get that. That's going to be a part of our budget. Uh, I know there's a question later on about how um, certain how production aspects are going to work, so I can save it for that. 
fortunately, you know, I will say a lot of our area is, is, is big. I will say that um, Rita already touched on a key thing that's going to happen is a lot of things are going to be done in pods. You know, a lot of things, uh, a lot of prep is going to happen remotely. And then you're going to have different teams on set at different times. Um, yeah. and, and so we're, we're coordinating uh, to that in that as well. One of the things we changed, because we have two separate cafeterias, one for each stage, we've changed all the seating layout so everything is socially distanced. The same thing with all of our offices. We've uh, made all of the multiple entrance and exits have to flow in a certain directional. And we have taken our loading bays and made them completely separate for deliveries so that things can be decontaminated before they come in. Yeah. So it's really been about rezoning the building in a way that we can contain and control. Yeah. And lastly, I would say that we're actually um, hiring, the, the stages itself is gonna be hiring someone who is sort of expressly there to monitor uh, everyone and everything, including the productions, to make sure that all these things are being observed so that we're doing sort of our part in this as production comes in and out. Because I think it's a shared responsibility between productions and facility, but we wanna make sure we're doing everything we can up to that sort of threshold. Cool. Uh, so yes, um, I've been being on a lot of calls with uh, location managers and the New York Production Alliance, which I'm, I'm sure you guys have too, and just watching how the whole um, protocols are evolving for um, filming in uh, during COVID. So uh, I looked at the space today and divided it into um, what I thought would be good zones, and of course it worked with whatever, whatever, whatever production company came in. But, um, you know, parceling out bathrooms and dining areas were, because uh, with the pods, uh, one of the calls today was a film that just wrapped in Iceland, and they had divided up the crew and the cast to uh, in four different colors. And so I, I looked at our space, which is not huge, and, and thought about how the space could be arranged with traffic patterns and uh, eating areas and bathrooms assigned to each color group. And um, I've also been working on finding uh, area uh, cleaning, cleaning companies that can come in and uh, do the work of, of cleaning. It's going to have to happen, you know, all day during the shoot. So uh, thinking about that kind of stuff. So um, my next question is for uh, Honey Film. So that's Nora. Um, how are you selling Orange County to prospective productions? Has it changed um, since the pandemic hit? No, Nora, you're still on mute. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> it hasn't really changed um, how I market uh, because I, I usually do an outreach. Uh, I get a production list every Sunday. And from that list, I am sending out like, uh, you know, letters, emails, uh, basically marketing the county. Um, one thing that may have changed is that I do tune in to more webinars. I kind of follow more filmmakers uh, and productions uh, more and more because everybody is on Zoom or on Instagram Live. Or So I may have stalked a production once or twice, uh, you know, uh, especially when they said that, oh, we haven't, you know, locked in a lo location. So I was able to, you know, look them up, kind of like message them in the chat and then uh, basically send, send them uh, all of our information, like including like sound stages, like, you know, uh, the measures that we are going, you know, to, you know, for, to ensure like safety and, and, you know, health measures. So I did get contacted back by, you know, uh, a couple of people. So crossing our fingers. So like, that's probably the only thing that has changed, you know, a little bit more in-person stalking and, uh, <laughs> uh, but that, that's about it. Yeah. So um, it's just been more outreach. Um, I haven't, since we've been locked down, uh, I haven't been able to do as much uh, scheduled scouts. I've been able to do scouts with like open woods and, you know, uh, basically get those prepped. But, uh, you know, since everything is like literally locked down, um, yeah, that, that's going to have to wait. But, um, yeah, we're still uh, 
selling it and um, people are responding. So uh, I know that uh, I have been getting calls. Unfortunately, they think that we're Orange County, California. So I've been getting a lot of panicked uh, calls saying, you know, oh, they need to finish and they need a house for like two weeks. And, you know, can I help them? And I was like, I would love to if you would just come to the East Coast. <laughs> but um, as far as I, I know, we're, we're kind of, we've, we've been getting calls in. They're basically in pre-production and they're just kind of like lining up at the gate and just waiting for us to open. Um, so as soon as they tell us, you know, go, then uh, hopefully it, the flood gates will open and, you know, production will come. Do you find that they're asking you about any safety precautions that, that we're taking in addition to what they've usually asked you? Uh, no. Well, the ones that I've been getting from California is just usually they're panicked <laughs> and they, they need to finish. Uh, the other ones, um, I've gotten a couple that they're just setting up for right now for 2021. So they're, they're doing like a, a whole, I think one is a series. So they're kind of trying to put all their ducks in a row. Um, and then, uh, but mostly they haven't really asked. They're just kind of like in the pre-production stage, but um, Summer was able to get me in touch or like uh, kind of put me onto a list from Film Florida with guidelines, which I loved. And, uh, and it, it was like six pages. And I was like, why is this six pages? And then I read it and I was like, freak, because all of these suggestions are definitely necessary since, um, you know, uh, sh they have one for Umbra, but like if somebody's not shooting at Umbra, then these productions coming in are going to need those suggestions and guidelines. Um, so hence, yeah, six pages is probably, I kind of added some stuff. So mine's a little bit longer. <laughs> I don't know. That's good. But, uh, yeah, I was. Uh, yeah. I read that same thing that Summer. That I think Summer shared that out. Yeah. And um, it, it was it was crazy how detailed it was. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's you know, very. Everyone gets plastic very, director's it, chairs. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's just, well, there's some stuff that like you know uh, we definitely don't need, and uh, but you know there's stuff that wasn't on there that we do need, uh, and then we have to cater it to New York City. And as you know, um, somebody mentioned before uh, we came on. We, as of right now, um, I believe it's like June we're supposed to be opening, but uh, film is like basically in the last stage. We're definitely trying to speak to everybody that we can, including our county executive, to try to, to bump that up. He's all game for that, but uh, at this time, like uh, we're following like the governor's guidelines but we're definitely trying to maneuver that so that we can uh, open up to production sooner in Orange County. Yeah, and I know um, there's a, some people that are uh, participating in this panel that um, are in the hospitality industry, which I think also got hit hard when film production shut down. Uh, yeah, so yeah, and, and like uh, we're, we're under tourism, which is, and we've got a great team. Uh, it, they're amazing. They're constantly working behind the scenes and like, uh, re like kind of like pushing it to, um, you know, the things that can happen once they, they do open up because we've have, we have a lot large open spaces. So like people can get away. They don't have to be remain like locked in, in their homes when we do open up, you know, we've got the drive-in theaters and which is, I think one is opening in Middletown, uh, this week or next week. Mm -hmm. So, um, there's a lot of stuff to social distance if people are afraid, but we are definitely taking, uh, you know, measures, especially the, the hospitality um, route, you know, are all of those vendors, all of those, those places, they're working hard, they're making sure they're putting in safety measures, and uh, the tourism team is really doing a great job to, you know, market what's open, uh, what you can do now, like the trails that are still open and available, so yeah you know it tune into like you know uh orange county tourism if you're in like over here in this part of the hudson valley because we've got a great team mm -hmm. agreed so rita has a question for you uh do you think um that some of these changes are going to affect the number of actors that are on set and um 
what are some ways do you think that you're going to be able to and productions are going to be able to deal with that? You're on mute. <laughs> I love that, that you guys are so like considerate putting yourselves on mute for everybody else. <laughs> Yes, we will be effective in the number of people on set. I'm only going to say because I've been working on a project down in Atlanta, which they're going to open up way sooner than we are. And film is not number four on their list, everything on there. So we've been working with the producer, and uh, it's the number of people on set. They want to keep it to under 10. It shifts with crew and um, extras. You know, you're going to have just a couple of extras in there for a set. They're going to have to put them in the green screen at this point until there's a vaccine. Because you, when you need extras, it's a crowd scene. How, unless you're going to be making a film that's socially relevant right now that's after the pandemic where we can shoot a scene with extras and they're socially distanced. That's the only way that's going to work. But principal photography and to keep the actors feeling safe, I mean, there's going to be temperature checks, everything. You know, um, what we're doing right now, because it's in Atlanta, is they are uh, going to have temperature checks, keep it under 10, house them in, this, in, in one location. House them in one location might, you know, would be, you know, say if you don't, you know, at your studios or if you're in the soundstage, if you don't have housing, they would say house them in just one hotel, you know. So we have, I know we have a lot of background actors that um, work here in the Hudson Valley. Uh, yeah. Do you think it's going to be more difficult for them to find jobs locally because of the reduction in actors? Because I think background work in the, for, in, in the rest of the country, it's not just the Hudson Valley. I think the rest of the country for a while, it's not going to be the same. Yeah. Because it's, it's large, it's large amount of people. Unless you know, the things we're going to come out with are going to be for these times where we're showing social distancing. Yeah. Okay, so my next question, guys, is uh, Stock Aid Works and Umber. So I'm going to start with Marie. Um, how will you face the difficulty of now educating future film professionals? And um, do you have the ability to teach remotely? And will students be able to intern on sets? Yeah, so, um, you know, we're in the process now of facing those difficulties. I think, you know, with every sort of negative uh, situation comes opportunities. So while our trainings are built for being hands-on and really teaching people how to work on a film production and television production, um, we're adapting to what we can online. Um, you know, and we've always wanted to sort of expand into post-production. So now we have that opportunity during this time to, you know, look at those, um, those classes that are more um, adaptable to online. So we're looking at developing that right now in the interim, um, but also doing things like career awareness programs that actually work very well online. We did one with Saugerties High School a couple of weeks ago, and it really gives us the ability to share this information with you know, a large group of kids. We were going to do it with a few schools at one time, but we wanted to start with one school. But that's something we can do fairly easily in the meantime. So we're at least making students aware that these jobs exist because we find that that's one of the barriers to entry into the field is that people think, you know, working in film is director, actor, all of the sort of, you know, big, big roles that you see that are very visible they don't really realize all of the great jobs, all of the hundreds of thousands of jobs that there are um, that, that would be available to them. So, you know, that's something that we're really taking this opportunity to do now. But I think, you know, I think we will get back to it. I think we're gonna have to follow the protocols that are, that are put in place, um, whether it's the protocols of the production itself, of the space that we train in, because we train throughout the Hudson Valley. So. You know, it's going to take a lot of coordination. I think it can be done. Um, you know, Tony said it earlier, I think everyone should adopt the same rules across the board. I think that would be helpful for everyone. Um, so, you know, I'm looking forward to that. And I think that's a great idea. And I think, you know, we will get to that place. And I do think that interns will be able to, I mean, that's just me being hopeful, but 
I think as long as the protocols are there and everyone is coordinating, I think that it can definitely happen. Summer and Tony, what do you think about that? Yeah, I agree. Um, and we already have uh, kind of started a new plan for how Below the Line Boot Camp and our internship program, we have two separate structures, will continue. But it's coming from the fact that our entire production workflow is probably going to change. I've been building budgets for two different networks that have reached out and um, are going to be working with us. And I think, just sidebar, I think the Hudson Valley is going to be busier than it was before because there's, that's the trend we're seeing just from this week alone with the outreach. But that said, the way we're looking at structuring productions, instead of having an entire crew land at the same time, you know, everybody's call time is the same. We're looking at breaking it into pods, into split shifts. We wouldn't be reducing crew at all, but it would be a much more efficient way. We will do the same thing with our training. So instead of having, you know, our classes of boot camp are usually 12 to 15 students. Instead of having them all sit in our conference room and learn, we'll be breaking them up and training them specifically to the pod that they're assigned to. So if they're mm -hmm. focusing on camera, they'll go with the camera team. The only real change is that they won't be able to hop from one sector to the next because then we can spread the disease through an entire crew instead of having it based in pods. Mm -hmm. I would just add to that, that as, as production parameters become more sort of universally sort of embraced uh, throughout with the community, so will uh, uh, programs such as uh, Below the Line Boot Camp, certainly Stockade Works, will sort of follow, the, follow that same path, whatever that is. Um, it could be uh, as simple as internet um, sort of online sort of orientation and then very uh, very centralized work. You're in this pod, you're working here. And, and the way our program is now structured, we do have a very uh, quick uh, orientation and then we throw them right into the fire of a production. And so they really streamline right into uh, a, a, what will essentially be a pod and it'll be organized. So it's really, it's really all going to be about uh, what the ultimate uh, sort of rules are for this that everybody feels comfortable and then are the most safe. And then that's how, you know, our interns and certainly our, 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 our boot campers will, will sort of follow suit. Yeah. I'm going to start this one up uh, with Ruth. Um, have you had productions reach out to you about filming um, in the near future? And have you had to discuss um, additional safety precautions uh, with preden uh, potential productions? Yes, yeah, we've had um, a lot of phone calls recently and um, I've started, you know, talking to people about where they feel the liability, the, you know, so insurance is going to be a big thing uh, moving forward and, and liability. So I've had a lot of conversations about that. And like, for instance, you know, we'll hand over the, the space clean and sanitized, but then the production company will be responsible for the, you know, as I mentioned before, the day-to-day -day upkeep of the space. Um, but there's just um, so much. Uh, the temperature checks, the health questionnaires, day-to-day -day stuff that's going to go into making the filming safe and the way it's going to impact everybody's budgets. Uh, there's other conversations I've been having because, you know, the range I've been hearing is about 20% on top of what was there before just for the health and security. What do you think, Summer and Tony? Um, but yeah, I, I'm very... Um, We've had um, we've had various people reach out. So there's there's a lot of work. As some someone was saying earlier, I think other people have been saying this as well. We're, we've sort of entered a log jam, certainly of, of projects that have been sort of waylaid, and now they're all sort of rushing to get to get off their books. And so we've had a lot of calls. Uh, they've all been safety minded. Uh, they've all wanted to know what our facility checklist is, how we're looking at it, and then they're in turn going to be coming back to telling us what their production, what their production is requiring. And this is kind of the conversation that has to happen. This is what their threshold is. This is what our threshold is. And where do the two meet? I think that's going to be a really, uh, a real, real conversation for all of us just to keep talking about as we experience uh, a reopening is, is well, what's your experience with this production? How does this work? How does that work? But to answer your question directly, a lot of people are out there. There's a lot of work that wants to, to come here, uh, maybe more so than ever. Certainly there's an, more intensity uh, and there's, there's, there's more intensity to it than it was before. And, and safety is the first thing on their mind.
And people have also been very curious into what alternatives they have from the original standard. For example, two very large productions um, have reached out and asked about how many private homes they could get instead of putting people into hotels. Um, I think that based on the budgets that I've been working on with a couple of these uh, productions, the areas that I've seen increase is the amount of time you need to have built in for cleaning. So it just means doubling or tripling your cleaning crew. Um, people to the set medics are doubling or tripling set medics so that one can be dedicated to temperature checks, one can be dedicated. And then everyone's expendables budget has probably doubled or tripled. I wouldn't say it's a 20% jump, but I would say it's about seven to 9% just on the ones that I've seen this week. That will obviously change and grow as you know, structures get more specific. Um, I'm not seeing as much fear as I anticipated. I'm seeing a lot of questions and solutions, which is encouraging. Yeah, I think it's, I think, I think it's, it's sort of incumbent upon all of us, certainly in the Hudson Valley region, to keep talking to each other as all this information comes down. I think, I think the more we're all unified in what the, what the response should be, uh, as long as we're all talking, as long as we're in concert with everybody, I think, I think the more unified we are, uh, the safer the region's going to be, and the more serious people are going to know about how serious we take it as we interface with all the other productions and unions, et cetera. Yeah. Speaking of housing, um, Ruth, how do you feel about, because I think you guys actually have housing on your property for productions. How are um, you going to prepare for that? And do you feel like that's kind of a benefit because you have everybody in one place? Ordinarily, I'd say yes. It's a housing that um, I think really suits the theatrical and uh, productions that we do better than film. And with the need to isolate as much as we're going to have, I think the housing upstairs will be for, uh, today I, I thought it would be for wardrobe, hair and makeup. Uh, and, and actors would be upstairs. But then I was thinking um, that, you know, they uh, one call today that said that tra uh, transport passenger vans are not really gonna be happening uh, moving forward. So that you're gonna wanna find housing close by the venue and people are gonna need to have their own cars as much as possible. And then with a lot of camps being canceled this morning, I'm gonna start reaching out to camps and the resorts in the area and see what they have uh, available so that, you know, everybody could be one place. Yeah, that's a good idea good idea yeah and um yeah and likewise with the catering you know there's not going to be the buffet situation anymore it's all going to be box lunch so figuring out what that's going to look like and where, where that could happen on the property yeah and do you feel like um and i know ruth you said it looks like it's going to be kind of did you say like a you tony and somebody said like a seven percent increase on production price oh, i'm sorry I was just going to say, so far, based on the people that have been reaching out to us, that's what it's looking like. Obviously, all of this is fluid. It can change. Yeah, and the budget is in flux, but as of today, it was between 7 and 9%. Yeah. You know, there's, there's going to be, I think things are going to become more concretized once all the unions have signed in, once the state signs in, once there's a more official yeah. uh, uh, sort of guideline. I think this could expand or contract accordingly. Okay, so uh, Nora, question for you. How do you think, and I think you kind of actually touched on this a, a little bit already, but how do you think film locations will be affected with these new changes? Um, I think there's going to be an increase in, in like uh, people wanting to be a location uh, because of the economic impact and people not working. I think that we're I'm probably going to see and like probably other film offices will see um, people wanting to list their homes, wanting to rent out their homes to talent as well. Um, so I think that there's, uh, Summer touched on it, it's, it's not like uh, people are not, not really fearful. They're kind of, you know, uh, questioning and a lot of them are eager to get back to work or to get back to like, you know, some kind of sense of normalcy. And one of those ways will be, you know, um, getting income, <laughs> you know, uh, any way that they can if they are not working. So uh, a lot, I think a, a lot of people are going to be signing up for locations. I think um, uh, Summer Antonio also and uh, Ruth also touched on it. Um, the cleaning part of, of like that home is definitely going, or like location is definitely going to be, have to be put into the budget. Um, 
whether it's like a private property or it's like, you know, um, a government property, uh, that cleaning detail uh, is definitely going to be built into whatever, you know, um, production comes there. Uh, so that's the only thing that I like uh, anticipate happening. And like, again, some productions use like a, a home for like, maybe like a couple of hours, um, maybe, you know, sometimes in not mo not many productions, but some allow like the family to come or like to live there during production. I don't think I'm, we're going to see that happening. I think that um, they will have to put uh, that uh, location owner up in like a, another location away from that crew just to make sure that there is no cross contamination. Um, that there's, you know, nobody going to Walmart and then coming into connection with the crew and then, you know, something happening. So uh, that's the only thing that I think will be uh, probably like, we're definitely issuing those guidelines, you know, to make sure that uh, the crews are basically contained amongst themselves and making those guidelines that uh, homeowners basically need to be put in uh, if they don't have like a, a place to go or whatever or if they don't have they need to be you know that production needs to pay, pay for their stay at another place um, speaking of um costumes i know that there's some uh, participants who are um in costumes as crew um and um that brings the question of you know where are they going to go purchase their their costumes and you know how are they going to you know, clean all those costumes uh, to make sure that they're not contaminated. It's a whole nother issue for them. That's probably a whole nother webinar. That's getting really into detail. <laughs> we, webinar. Lisa, are you on? <laughs> we just added four commercial laundry centers at Umbra specifically for this reason with their own separate wash areas. It was a whole wing we added because that was one of the first things a crew member said is how are we going to make sure that the clothing is sanitized? So, yeah. Yeah, that's a big issue. Uh, so I want to jump to Rita. And Rita, um, you are known for always visiting the sets of your projects. So I want to know how you feel about that now. Are you still going to be visiting with the pandemic? Yes. I will be wearing the sparkly mask. <laughs> I will be. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I have no plans to not visit. I just want to touch on that I do believe, because I've been speaking to a lot of people all over the city, not just up in, in Manhattan, a couple of people all over the country. And I do believe, especially because Manhattan and all the other boroughs are so congested, that we are going just like summer and, and we are going to be swamped. Mm -hmm. People are not going to want to shoot in lower New York. They're going to want to shoot upper. And I think that we're going to, we might have to hold our breaths for a while, but we're going to be that busy. And I had a feeling that was going to happen when this was over. <laughs> but yes, I, I'm not going to change going sets. I will just wear a mask. <laughs> yeah, protect, yeah, be all protected, but fancy with like rhinestones and stuff, right? <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> so, um... So I think we already kind of touched a little bit on this, but if you guys wanted to add any more to this question, um, either Ruth or Summer or Tony, um, how will studios address um, holding rooms, dressing rooms, and crafty uh, during productions? Well, I don't think there's going to be crafty, um, uh, actually. And then um, things will be, like I mentioned a little bit before, um, really broken up and segregated. So like the cast and the, would be upstairs and then, um, you know, somebody, some people would have an all access, access pass, but then there'd be backstage and backstage, on set, uh, cast, and then art department would be at another part of our facility, I think. And I think there really is going to be very conscious limiting of visitors to sets. I think it's going to be, you know, trying to keep that head count as low as possible. Um, so for, for holding, I would say two things, and we had a list that we were going to send, uh, however, we can't send it here. So we reached out to people they want to receive, uh, see what our guidelines are. We can, we can email it, email to it. Um, you know, our holdings and crafting, all of that's separated. We're, uh, our, all of our dressing rooms are single occupancy anyway, so that's really not changing. 
Um, in terms of Crafty itself, I mean, these, these, these really are becoming just a self-packaged, self-contained affair. It's just not open food anymore. Uh, we're working with Pamela's on the Hudson and her catering, where she's been uh, putting together a sort of a green uh, plan uh, that she basically has individually prepared, wrapped, uh, protected Crafty, and people will just get meals, it. Yeah. Me meals as well, but also Crafty on the top. Of, it, it'll, it'll extend to Crafty too. You know, the days of Crafty and that craft table are sort of passing, which I will tell you, I've always been a little leery of the craft service table. So <laughs> the little little nuts that everybody reaches in. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's sort of like the sort of, it's sort of the uh, the, the, the infinite uh, bowl of peanuts on a bar <laughs> counter. It's just that I don't know. I just don't know if I want to commit to that. So I'm okay with yeah, that. And, you know, one thing I will say, the first thing when we started talking about all this, I was like, no, the plastic's going to kill us. Like, we've been trying to be so green. I'll say we found two vendors, and Pamela's working with them. And um, Joe Facey of Joe's Craft Service is also doing a whole new plan for how to remain as green as possible, but as safe as possible. There is a company that has basically plant based plastic that they can seal the food for you from the, the you know, local kitchen that they're preparing it in. And that is um, compostable. Even yeah. their forks are compostable. And we use them on our last production. And I'm happy to report it actually broke down in our little compost area. So I, I want to figure out how we can be safe, but also green because the plastic, it's just too much. But there are solutions. Sorry, that was a long rainbow answer. <laughs> that was good, though. That was good though. Okay. You know, we like to be green. We just kidding. Just kidding. I'm impressed with that. <laughs> only summer, only summer. So, um, last the last question, guys, um, and then we're going to open it up to Q and A from the participants. Our last question is, um, and this I'm going to start with Marie, but then you guys can jump in if you want to add. Um, do you think the Hudson Valley? We'll be able to spring back to the amount of filming we had prior to this pandemic. And what do you think we have going for us that's going to bring that back? Uh, yeah, for sure. A thousand percent. I think it's going to come back better than ever. Um, as everyone here has said, I think that there's going to be a desire to be here versus downstate. Um, so I think we should be ready because I think it's really just going to happen and it's going to be amazing but we all should be prepared. And I would ask the question, what do, don't we have? I mean, I feel like we have everything here. Mm -hmm. Beauty, space, uh, vistas. We have, uh, most importantly, very talented people. Local people, we have people who need jobs. Um, and the most important thing, especially for Stockade Works, and I think everyone here would agree, is that these productions coming to the region provides jobs for people. And we have plenty of people here, especially now, who can benefit from all of that economic opportunity of productions coming to this region. So we are ready. We're ready to go. And I think it's going to be better than ever. Anybody else want to jump in on that before we go to the q and I, 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 I would just second that. I just think that's so true. I think the tide was already turning. People were already looking at the region. This was already becoming a place where people were looking to shoot uh, for all the reasons that Louis just mentioned. I, I just agree with her wholeheartedly. I think this will, this will get better. We will get better. We will be stronger. And I think the region will be better. Well, I can only say from experience, um, the producers on I Know This Much are True, some from LA, from the city, they would 100% want to come back. Yeah, I agree. Uh, we've got the locations and we have the production facilities that are even more, they're, they're like uh, getting ready for post-COVID, implementing all of these great guidelines. And it's not only in Orange County, it's all over the Hudson Valley. So because we have a deep crew base, because we have people who are just like really, they, re they want to work. They want to work. We have the large open spaces uh, and like touching on like the locations. Another thing that's probably going to change is that like uh, locations or homes that are bigger and have like larger properties, they're definitely going to benefit if they have multiple buildings that, you know, video village could be over here and like people can social distance. If you have tents, if you have barns, 
you know, that are not uh, buildings that are not in use. Um, those things are going to come into play. And uh, the fact that we have, we have airports that are not as crowded. We have like multiple points of entry from like, you know, Pennsylvania, different uh, places. They're not going to want to, uh, many people are not going to want to go and land in JFK and LaGuardia. They're going to want to land in the smaller ones, more contained. So I think that uh, those like logistically, we're just really perfectly positioned for this wave that's coming up. We've already seen, seeing it, like uh, everyone, Marie said it, uh, Summer and Tony said it, we, we were already seeing that, that tide, like, you know, start to turn up here with like, you know, with here today and like, you know, I know this much is true, which was like all over the Hudson Valley, which was amazing. But uh, we're gonna, we're, I think we're gonna see that even more. And, um, you know, that whole Hudson, you know, Hollywood on Hudson, you know, it's, I think we're really going to live up to that name, especially, you know, uh, Ruth with the, you know, whatever she's building up there and, you know, with Summer and Tony, whatever they have. And, you know, you guys in Kingston, it's all coming together. It's like, we may be like in, a, you know, in our own community or like separate regions, but we're kind of like, you know, the Hudson Valley, we're a group and we definitely can support each other and you know just support like this new wave that's coming because it's not only about Orange County it's not only about Kingston and you know Ulster County or whatever we're it's it's I would love it if a production came here to our region rather than California you know and we have the resources and we've got the manpower we've got like the drive and hey we're ready. We're ready to open. Hopefully, they just have to, you know, give us the go ahead. Very nicely stated, Nora. I 100% I agree with all of that. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to start. I have a couple questions from participants. Uh, the first one is from uh, Noah Graham, actress. Hi, Noah, if you're still out there. Um, Rita, this is a casting question. Uh, Noah wants to know. Um, what are the possibilities of making it easier for actors to find work without duplicating the effort and expense of creating mini studios at home? Uh, it, you don't have to create a mini studio at home. Um, I think just your phone and a tripod with a little mic attached to your phone, which would be an expensive I don't think the expense of a whole mini studio is going to be needed because right now, I mean, to be honest with you, I shot every audition for I know this much is true on my Google with my tripod. Yeah, I see a lot of actors just doing on their cell phones. Yeah, everybody. I a lot of a lot of the seasoned actors do have their own mini studios because they have made the money in principal acting to set it up. If you're just starting out, you don't need to go through all the expense because there's so many attachments for our phones now. There's little mini tripods to put on a desk, you know, and the clip-on lights you can put on your phone and the clip-on mic to put on your phone. You're good. Thank you, Rita. So questions from Dennis Eau Claire. Hi, Dennis. Um, it's a two-part question. He says, oh, he's so wordy. So here you go. <laughs> if, is there any effort being made in the region to implement a COVID-19 safety training program? Oh, good question, Dennis. This would be a training course for all film, TV, and video production crew that would teach them proper use of PPE, distancing, and other C-19 safety protocols for working on a film, TV set, and or in video production. It's a good question, Dennis. Um, and then he says he's heard that SAG is working on a white paper to address this. And of course, this would be welcome. Unfortunately, these big organizations don't always address the issues and concerns of smaller companies and smaller productions, but they usually presume to speak for everybody. Are there any other solutions or training programs that indie and similar independent non-union productions could use to help get back to work sooner? Um, 
I'll just jump in real quick and then pass it along. But uh, we've been actually chatting with the Directors Guild, uh, DGA. They have a program that all unit production managers and ADs have to take, which is called the Safety Pass Training. And it's fully OSHA backed and it's about, um, about six hours is what it adds up to. They're um, hopefully going to be developing a COVID addition to that. And it is an online training program that is very effective. It's got a lot of video content, a lot of, uh, it's question and answer. So there may be a way to do this remotely until we're able to actually set up larger in-person training. And OSHA just put out brand new protocols. I also have that, it's about 46 pages long, but it's very informative and um, you can learn a lot just from reading it, so. I think, I think also just to add to that on a from a facility standpoint, I've been hearing a lot of talk about having an actual position that is a COVID supervisor, someone that is specifically there for education, for monitoring. Yeah. Uh, so I think this is going to become a, not only what Summer was saying, but it's, I think it's going to become a position. I mean, I think it's the new world we live in. And maybe it could be something that you do at a production meeting. I mean, you know, before your tech scout, there could be a, everybody come together and this is how this production is going to function. That'll fall more on the producers and the production company. But I think it's something that our stages could also offer um, as an extra incentive. Yeah, and we're also thinking that we're adding that to our rotation of trainings eventually that there will be a safety department on set, whether it's a medic, whether it's safety coordinator so adding that eventually to our training programs is going to be something that we need which is you know another opportunity for jobs <laughs> yeah okay so i have another question uh from kim sawyer hi kim um she says oh hold on i'm in the chat here Will the, will the region and industry in general still be very accepting of non-union productions and non-union crew members? She keeps the negative articles about it. Yeah, I think it's going to happen. I think the industry in itself right now, because of finance, of course, is going to be interested in non-union productions because, quite honestly, we all know we work in this area. That's money, you know, the budget what it's all about so definitely but I also know that I do work I have worked on non-union and I'm sure the people that I have worked with will be looking at safety as we discussed it is going to be a big liability so there's no option really whether the union or non-union everybody's going to have to follow it okay so uh Jen did you have a question in the Q&A box Hi, everyone. Yes, I have one here. I just want to say thank you to all of our panelists for joining us, as well as all participants. Uh, there is one question here from Lars Elling Lundy. I oh, hi, Lars. <laughs> <laughs> hi. Um, it says, I have been wondering what is going to be figured out for talent who are scripted uh, to come in physical contact with each other, um, either for conflicts or intimacy, story elements. He says, that's a tricky one. <laughs> okay. Hey. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Rita. Go ahead. You talk. No, no. You can go, Tony. And no, no. That's actually you. <laughs> that's actually you. You go. <laughs> I've, I've come across it. That's why I was going to answer it, because I am doing a script right now in Atlanta that has, does have some images. They're going to have to be tested. They're going to have to be tested beforehand. I mean, the, you can't cut intimacy out. And then it's like... It's not realistic. It's then we're like cutting intimacy out of our lives, which is not really realistic and it's never going to happen. They're going to have to get tested beforehand is the only way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah, I would, I would only, yeah, I think that's right. I would only add that I think what we're looking at is we're looking at, uh, in terms of talent, is we're looking at testing. And then once they're testing, we're looking at talent being quarantined for a duration of a shoot yeah. so that they're not in a position to be infected. And I think that's, that's sort of the best efforts that we're, we're looking at right now. I wanted, I wanted to circle back to the Kim's question about the unions, non-union question, because I think that's actually a very interesting one too. I don't, I don't necessarily see the dynamic changing uh, so much as it did before. What I do worry about, and this is really the big question that everybody is still wondering about, is just where does insurance come into all of this? 
And if you get to a point when it's getting harder and harder to get insurance on your production uh, because of COVID, I know that right now some insurance companies are not covering it. Infectious diseases don't come into it, which, is, which, is, which becomes something that only the bigger productions can weather should something come up. And so there's an economic factor to a non-union, which is traditionally of a smaller budget. And if you're traditionally of a smaller budget, that's going to mean you can't weather taking four or five days off while you replenish a crew or rotate out. And so I think think it's an I, I don't think the dynamic changes simply because of this uh, I don't think we come back and suddenly you there's no longer any non-union work I think it's just going to be harder I think there's going to be more more complications and at a certain budget level like that's what you need but you get it and you have to figure out how to roll with it so I guess that but unless you see something no I was just going to say a portion of the budget even on the smallest film on the ultra ultra low there's always a contingency spend and if you're an uh, I see Jillian just ask a question you know is it going to be the end of the low budget movie I don't think so I just think that it means it has to have much more efficiency and much more planning to prevent a situation that could cause a shutdown yeah. so you know for producers who are working on low budget things that early planning stage is the most important, in my opinion. Got another question, Jen, on the Q&A? Yes, we have a question from Rebecca Cote. Again, hope I'm saying that correctly. Uh, this is a general question, let's see. With all the precautions being taken and trying to limit exposure, do you think this will make productions more likely to hire more local crew uh, versus bringing in their own people from the city or elsewhere? I, I can tell you everything that has reached out to us in the past two weeks, and we're talking multiple productions top and top. The first thing they say after, is your stage going to be available, is how many local crew do you have? So I think that's going to be a really nice trend um, for the area. I agree. And we were, even before this, we were hearing that more and more from productions. And I agree with Summer, that's just going to, I think, escalate now, post-COVID, for sure. I think that's one of the perks is having a group crew when there. I think it's only going to get better. I agree. Okay, and I have another from Patty Dines. Hi, Patty. Uh, will technicians who live alone in the Hudson Valley have to be housed or will they be allowed to sleep at home? I've not heard any, um, I had one production say they might think about quarantining, but this was several weeks ago before the antibody testing was available. Um, I, I, I don't foresee that happening. Although if someone's really, really worried and they have a budget to do that and buy out a hotel or buy out 10 or 12 houses, maybe, I, I haven't run across that yet. And I think that you just touched on something really very interesting is the antibody tests. I think that probably is going to come into play when getting hired. I think that will come into play in getting on set. And, you know, they're going to ask crew or, or you know, cast to go and take some antibodies. I also think not to not to get in the weeds on this. I also think insurance is going to play a big a big is going to have a lot to say with this. What they will cover depending on what. And I, I think that I think that 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 question whether you quarantine an entire crew is going to come down to whether or not the insurance mandates it. I think you're going to find you're going to find that's going to be a big uh, along with the unions along with the state guidelines. You're going to find what a company will insure. Uh, and what you have to do in order to be insured will be, uh, will be what determines a lot of that as well. And I will say, if a whole crew has to be quarantined together, I, I remove my previous statement about budget, 40% jump, because now you have housing and per diem <laughs> mm -hmm. and idle days. I don't even, I can't even wrap my mind around that. As a line producer, I'm breaking out right. hives even thinking about right. it. <laughs> and, and you've also now, you've also effectively eliminated What's exciting about coming to the region where productions outside don't have to bring crews in to house those crews. Now we've now something now suddenly it's not as cost efficient. So hopefully we don't have to get there and hopefully there's a safe way to do it uh, that uh, it doesn't make this kind of thing prohibitive.
those are the questions that I have on my end at the moment. Oh, you're just muted, Sunny. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. So this is a question for Rita. Uh, what do you think will happen in terms of background actors? Will real actors still be used or will productions go CGI on us? I think until there's a vaccine, we're not going to have the background scenes. I had to address this before. Um, and I have been reading and trying to, you know, get some research on this. I just don't think until there's a vaccine or, you know, you can come back anti antibody tested that we're going to have big crowds. I think until it's safe to do so. I mean, wait, you know, we're having really good, you know, look into having a vaccine soon. So hopefully we won't have to worry about this so long. And that was a question from uh, Jessica Rothman. Hi, Jessica. Uh, here's another question from uh, Noah Graham again. Hi, Noah. Uh, she's curious if you think the increased work coming into the area is a sign of further industry decentralization coming nationally. Any other thoughts about how the industry may change structurally? Um, I can only say that, you know, having had some like I know this much is true who based at our stages for seven months and filmed all over the Hudson Valley having the word get out from large large corporations getting it into the water supply how incredible the Hudson Valley is only makes the demand more so I think it's spreading the word spreading the word and, and continuing to have people have a great experience it's such an incredible film community. I mean, there's so much here and everybody works together and there's not this weird competitive, it's just a love fest, you know, in a way that I am stunned by every day. I think that what, it's like a great restaurant. Once somebody hears about it, there's a wait list, you know, I feel like it's the same kind of thing. So if people can come here and have a great experience, their dollars go far and, the, and it's an environment in which they can succeed creatively, the sky's the limit, you know? Well, I have a funny story coming to relocating up here from the city to do the show. I had gone to a local restaurant, Poughkeepsie, and if you see the first scene, the waitress, Kristen, was my waitress. So, <laughs> I fell in love with the Hudson Valley and the people here. Everywhere I met, I met people. And even when I didn't say what I did, because that was attractive, people wanted it. You know, even just as a regular person, everybody is just so nice. It's very attractive to work here. And I have been, I was going to do a huge Bollywood film, which I don't know if foreign films are going to be coming in soon. And all I kept saying is, can we do it in the Hudson Valley? I know everybody here. You know, I'm trying to push all my people to shoot here now. That would be great if we had a Bollywood show. That would be a lot of background actors that one. Oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have another one. Um, this is from Nancy Spano. Hi Nancy. Coming into this industry recently and starting out as a background actor, I'm working on becoming SAG after eligible. How would I be able <laughs> to work towards my goal of acting without the background experience? Thanks in advance. That's, Should I answer that? That sounds like a reader question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think you need to be SAG after to start doing principal work. That's not necessarily the truth. Um, locally, uh, there aren't a lot of agents. An agent or a manager would definitely help you gain more principal work, but I'd say having the right material, getting a headshot together, having some material to show talent, whether you're union or not, doesn't matter. I, I you know, starting out, nobody's in the union, so I don't think that'll come into play. I mean, I've gotten thousands of people into the union over the years. And um, especially now, I don't think it's going to be that important. Right now. So, you know, practice your craft, do some, you know, do some research, get some training, and you can do anything. Thanks, Rita. Um, this is a question from Carl Walden. Hi, Carl. 
Um, he says, can the sound department implement additional boom operators who can easily work more than six feet away versus still having to wire up talent, requiring that they work in the talent's personal space? Or will all talent be required to wire themselves and be responsible for their dedicated uh, LAVS and transmitters? That's a fantastic question. That's a really fantastic question because you're, you're sort of in a position where if you don't uh, have a sound person interface with an, with an actor, you're now limiting yourself to just one option for sound, which as a director I find terrifying. Uh, it may be a situation that's, that's similar to what we were saying with actors working in the same uh, location, which is they also have to test and there has to be probably some level of quarantine involved in that too. Um, I, think, I think it's tricky. I think that's a tricky, it's a great question because they, they have to interact. And I think the, the uh, goal is to limit as much interaction as possible. But uh, I think there's a quality threshold and you have to make sure that you're not saying, well, we're not going to have mics now. It's all going to be booms because that's just how this is just to observe that. And maybe that's true with some things, uh, but um, it may just be a matter of we have to make sure that everybody is, is well and uh, they are as they're miking someone using protective you know, protective gear. Because by the way, just because the, 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 the sound person is not there, his gear is. So it's not necessarily, you know, there, there's, a, there's a contamination point or a potentiality for that as well. Great question. I, 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 think, I think it's just, these are the kinds of things that we're just gonna have to come to as, as they come up. And Carl, we would love your input on our one sheet for, for pods, you know, the sound department. We've talked to a couple of people. Please, let's yeah. put, put our heads together and get your wise counsel on yep. how to make it more efficient and safe and high quality. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I have another question from Susie Chica. Uh, let me know where I can list my small farmhouse in Tivoli for location shoots. Well, you can uh, list your, your uh, location at Orange County, um, orangecountynyfilm.org, or you can um, email me uh, at nmartinez at orangecountygov.com, and I can post it, uh, all of my locations. I usually like uh, share it with Umbra as well, just to let them know, hey, here's the new locations. I share it with like most location scouts. Um, so it goes out in a monthly newsletter. Um, so generally about 300 um, scouts are getting that uh, those locations or like have access to those lists uh, on our website. And we have two, two places that I usually um, post those uh, on our website and on our Smug Mug page. Our Smug Mug page looks way better than our website. But um, yeah, uh, you can list with us uh, and we'll be more than happy to, to post or like a, or place a link. If you're outside of Orange County, um, we're thinking about placing like a some kind of like a regional thing, like a like an outside of Orange County um, thing, because like if somebody's going to base at Umbra and like they can go right over the bridge to Duchess or you know a little bit over here to Poughkeepsie or you know uh, a little bit like cross this side and it's like Rockland, but they're still basing in, in Umbra. We kind of want to if if like finding all of those locations is going to land that produ that production we're gonna put that out. So uh, we're, we're looking into building some kind of a map that uh, includes different regions where it'll be like, okay, Orange County, and then it'll be um, uh, locations near Orange County, you know, that are easily accessible with like, and just like put key areas, like these locations are close to Umbro, or these locations are close to you know, this sounds, or like, you know, qualified production uh, stage. So we're, we're definitely thinking about coordinating and we haven't implemented it yet, um, but that's something that if, if you are outside of Orange County, please just send it to me and we will file it and put it on there. Something just came in and the Hudson Valley Film Commission is also a good place to list your, your location mm -hmm. or you know or for an actor or a crew the Hudson Valley 
they were very, very, very helpful. Uh, so another question, guys, is, is this is from Elizabeth Henry. Hi, Elizabeth. Is there any reason to believe agents or managers may begin to work out of the Hudson Valley? Um, there are so many really talented actors that are here. Okay. Well, being that I still have my management company and there was no, honestly, when I started scouting up here, I looked for agents in the Hudson Valley and uh, there are no, there are no. So um, I, I, I'm not going to do it. I want to continue on with casting, but I do think it would be smart. Definitely smart because I found, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of talented people. I'm sure there's thousands, but. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, and Summer, if you wanted to uh, email up with that sheet that you wanted to email to everybody, I can just send it out to everybody. Oh, great. Participating in the panel. Perfect. Thank you. And oh, thank you. looks like we're all done with questions. Is there, unless there's anyone else, let me just check the chat real quick. It looks like everyone's saying thank you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, looks good. All right, guys. Oh, one more question here. Let's see. How is the supply chain for disinfectants for departments going to be guaranteed? Um, we put in an industrial supply order about two weeks ago that we're stocking up for, you know, as long a time as we can. However, we have noticed that the wait time is greatly reduced. I think that you know, the companies are finally catching up. There's also a great uh, industrial supply based in uh, Newburgh that makes their cleaning solutions on site and they have the commercial sprayers on site so they don't have to wait to get shipments in. I mean, I think a month ago it was a lot scarier than it is now. My husband's a rep at Cisco, he's number one in, in uh, Jersey and they do eco labs, they have everything back now. They, they have more sanitizer, more, they're getting, it's stocked up now, but like you said, you might want to stock up. As Summer said, you might want to buy more than you need. Yeah, we put in a big order about two weeks ago also. I think we're getting it the first week, week of June. All right, guys, looks like we're going to call it a night. Thank you so much to our panelists who were awesome. I, I actually very much miss working with uh, all of you and seeing all of you throughout the year uh, in some capacity uh, and also a lot of our panelists or participants who um, I haven't seen in so long. I miss you guys and I hope that we do start making some films in the Hudson Valley really soon. So thank you very much guys. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank stay. you for having me. Thank Thanks everybody. Okay. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay yep. well. Stay safe. Stay well everybody. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye. <laughs>